Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast presented by Dr. Jody Jones DDS. We're part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Luke Wyatt, we will talk about Vanderbilt's win over Florida in football. The guest line is presented by Michael Kendrick of the Kendrick Group. Michael is a local carpenter and a lifelong Vandy fan. He builds bookshelves, cabinets, picture frames, furniture, and made-to-order items. That includes a display case for my prized Dale Murphy jersey that is hanging over my left shoulder in my office. I've seen Michael's work. He's a true craftsman. If you're in the market for custom woodwork, give Michael a call. That number is 615-830-9548. Now on to our show today with Luke Wyatt. Luke Wyatt joins us today in the aftermath of Vanderbilt's win over Florida at home this weekend. Luke, I got to be honest, I didn't see that one coming. Well, we talked about it, and... uh... I, I basically said the same thing I've been saying. If we get it to a fourth quarter game, we start fast, get a lead on them. They're not not necessarily they're sleepwalking. I don't want to take anything away from our kids. Our kids played great, but uh, I love playing Florida at 11 a.m. on a cold Saturday morning. I love it, and uh, I think it worked out to our advantage again. And um, when we got to uh, deciding the game, by the time they were ready to play the 100 percent, it was too late for them. Uh, so it, it, uh, it was a great day. I'm really, again, happy for the kids and happy for Clark. And I'm not trying to say I told you so, but I just feel like that, you know, Clark's got, he's got, he's got this. He really does. And, uh, the future is so bright. I'm wearing my sunglasses right now. I think what shocked me the most, you knew what Florida wanted to do. It's going to be run the ball. Florida did not run the ball effectively all day. Average two two yards a carry and average six coming in. I know that Vanderbilt got thrown on, but to be able to take away what Florida wanted to do, I mean, that and the, just the big plays, the turnovers, the punt, were really, I thought, the two biggest things in that win. I think so, and I, I don't know who said this, Chris, where I heard it at a ball at the ball game, maybe or someone. Maybe. Bill Belichick always has a saying: "We try to take away your right arm," and that's what they did. Take away what they do best. If you can do that and make them play left-handed, so to speak, uh, and I think that's what we did. We made Florida. They they said, "Okay, we got eight, nine, ten in the box here. We're going to have to throw it. Let's throw it. We can throw on them." And they were able to throw on us, but still, it wasn't enough to win the ball game, and it took them out of their identity. I think the staff is doing an amazing job getting what it is getting out of that defensive line because uh, Christian James and Nate Clifton are playing really well. They got Davion Davis back. We've talked about what a patchwork patchwork it's been on the edge with the injuries, and I, I think it's safe to say they are getting the most out of that group of guys. They're wringing the most out of the rag, there's no question. And, and the same thing with the offensive line. You know, three starters have been out for a lot. And what Blazik has done, uh, what Coach Black and Javon Hay have done, I mean, I, I uh, it's hard to find any fault with those guys. They're doing a tremendous job uh, with a lot less than the, the people they're going into battle with right now. I'm glad you mentioned Javon's name. I have a funny story. I don't, I don't think he'd kill me for telling this, but I'm in the restroom between the third and fourth quarter. And I walk in, and I'm, I'm surprised. You don't like expect to see a coach during the game, um, but I walked in, and I'm just surprised. And he said hello, and the first thing out of my mouth is, "Man, you guys are really playing well." And I, I did not even have the words out of my mouth. And he looks at me and says, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, shh," as if as if I'm going to jinx it by verbalizing it right then and there. But that was <laughs> that was kind of funny in hindsight. That is great. Yeah. Yeah, the, the offensive line, too, I, I think, again, this team has established an identity, the, the injuries, all those things. Um, it wasn't the prettiest offensive performance, but Vanderbilt, I thought, with Ray Davis, controlled the clock well enough to to get it done. Well, you know, 
I go back, just go back five weeks and look where this football team was and look where the fan base, what our fan base was and how people felt about it. And, and I've never gotten down with the 55 to nothing and the 50, whatever the Alabama score was. But these kids, and, and Clark alluded to it in his post game, this doesn't happen unless they go through that. And, and it's hard, it's a hard lesson to learn that, hey, we got to keep working, and, and if, we, if we do, good things will finally happen. And it's hard to keep 18 to 20-year-olds to do that, and that's where you have to give that staff, not just Clark, that whole entire staff, all those assistants and everyone involved with the program on a daily basis, the trainers, the weight room, that's where they get that from. You know, if you, if you come in and the trainer is sitting there, oh, boy, I'm glad we get this season over with, or the equipment guy's bitching because, well, we just got three more weeks, we can get through this. You know, if that kind of attitude's going on, you don't win games. It takes everybody involved that's there in that end of the building. If you don't have it, you got one bad apple in that group. That's why Clark has done a tremendous job of saying we got one message here. Everybody's got to have the same message to these kids when you see them throughout the day. If I'm being honest, when I sat at that South Carolina game in that press conference where they didn't play well, you got oh, the Dan Jackson distraction. I'm I'm just thinking, yeah. because I'm thinking at that point, when I'm walking out, I'm just thinking, this is the point of the season where they just need to get it over and move on to the off season and hit the reset button. Right, and to be able to turn, yeah, <laughs> there. <laughs> because seriously, that's that's the whole thing. It's so easy. I mean, look look how easy it was for you to say, let's just get this over with, move to next year. Those kids still saw that there was a lot left to, to bite off. And, boy, have they taken a big bite. They've done a great job with that. And, 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 and that's not easy. That's not an easy thing to do. It really isn't. No. No, I, di- I just didn't think it could be done at that moment. Yeah. Well, we're, we're sitting here now with a chance to be bowl eligible. And, uh, you know, we have the same chance to beat Tennessee as we did Florida. Uh, I, I just can't turn it over. Uh, I w- if they had Hooker, it would obviously be a lot more difficult chance. But uh, I-, I think if you put pressure on Joe Milton, uh, he'll high- make them high and right. He-, he loves to get rid of that football if he sees it coming. I'm not talking about sacking him. I'm talking about getting close to him. If you watch film on him, which I've watched a lot, you uh, he wants to get rid of that football. He does not like contact, which is kind of strange for a big old kid like him. But he doesn't like it at all. Um, there's a couple places I want to go next. Sure. And I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, well, first of all, let, let's, let's hit on Tennessee for just a minute. What a bizarre weekend for the Vols. I d- did not see that coming in the South Carolina game. No, uh, if that was going to happen, um, I would have thought that would have happened at maybe the LSU game. but And, you know, people don't think about this, but it's so important. You realize that was Tennessee's first road game at night. And really? the crowds are just – yeah, the crowds are just different at night in the SEC. When, we, when I worked at Bandy all those years, when we had a night game, man, they, they were worked to a fever pitch because they'd been getting oiled up all day. We had a lot of games that we played at night and I felt like that we may have lost it were close when I was there. If you play them at 11 o'clock in the morning, as silly as that sounds, you probably win the game because the crowd isn't into it. And the kids aren't into it. Those college kids hate to wake up early in the morning and have to eat that pregame meal and they don't feel like eating, but they have to stay on the schedule. It's just a different deal. When they play at night, they've they're rested. They've been laying around the hotel watching football all day. They're ready to play. So them only having to play one, I don't know how that worked out, but only one night game, on the road, uh, and you saw the atmosphere at South Carolina. It was rabid. It was at the, at the peak of how their fan base could be, and uh, uh, Tennessee wasn't ready for it. That's the thing that astonished me. Is Tennessee not being ready? You had the, the Jeremy Banks suspension. The defense just never showed up. I'm just curious. Like, How does that happen when you are – Preparing for the college football playoff, I mean, I thought they had two slam dunk wins there, Luke. I did, too. I think everybody did. And, and you know, you look at the Vegas line, they were, what, 22-and-a-half points? 
So basically, if you flip those points, that they won the game eighty-five to thirty-eight. Think about that. Wow! If you flip the point the game, they won the game eighty-five to thirty. No, I thought that maybe South Carolina would cover a spread or something, and maybe have a chance in the fourth quarter, being down maybe a touchdown or two, if they were. Able. But I never thought that they would be that efficient offensively, and that I don't understand why Tennessee did what they did defensively in the secondary. I'm not talking about how poorly they played. I'm talking about the scheme. They were, t- I mean, it was it was pitch and catch. It looked like a seven on seven drill. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, man, I'm I'm looking at, at this game. I'm I'm at covers.com. This started as a sixteen and a half point line, which I never would have believed two weeks ago. I would have said it's Tennessee and probably 35. 30, 35. And I know that the Hendon Hooker injury, and if people weren't aware of this, Hendon Hooker, Tennessee's quarterback, has torn his ACL apparently and is going to miss the game. And I hate that because everything I see and hear about him is he's a really good dude. He's a leader. He's had a great season. He was probably the the front runner for the Heisman Trophy coming into the week. And you never like to see a matchup change on that. And I know that Joe Milton – it's a much different animal. Hooker beat him out last year. And his line's been really good. Like, he's thrown for almost 600 yards and, and six touchdowns and no picks and, like, 33 attempts. His his efficiency right. numbers are off the chart. Now, look, I, I guess those a lot of those are probably coming against Ball State and Akron and uh, some right. teams like that where they were in the middle of blowouts. I get it, but statistically, he's better. I'm just looking at this line. And I'm looking at leaving, I guess, your best defender behind, and you don't really get a coherent explanation for that. Now Tennessee, I'm not going to say Tennessee doesn't have something to play for because it does, but you just look at how Tennessee didn't show up last week in a game that was probably, I mean, every game after you're in that contention is probably the most important game you played as a program in 20 years. And to look at this and see the line, all the way down to 14 after starting at 16 and a half. And yes, I, I know Hooker's not playing, but May Vanderbilt has not been able to stop anybody in the passing game. What is going on with this? Well, that's the whole thing, I think. And, and it's what I just mentioned a while ago. When Joe starts a football game, and I, you saw a little bit of this against Ole Miss last year. If you remember when he came in, he does things, intangible things, that aren't good usually. Now, he may come in and play perfect Saturday and they run up 55 points against us. But if you remember the Ole Miss game on the, the biggest play of their game, he just stepped out of bounds. He didn't even throw it. And it was on a fourth down. I mean, he doesn't have that in. That's why he's not the starter. He doesn't have that extra oomph. He doesn't have that recognition when, what things, when things are important and what they need to do. The other night when he came in, I know he threw that long bomb for a for a, like a sixty yard completion, but did you notice the other passes that he was throwing were real high and to the right? And he's that's just who he is. And the reason why, when there's pressure, and this was his knock at Michigan, when he it doesn't have to be a sack or someone even touching him. When you get near him or he sees it coming, sees where the blitz is coming from, he gets rid of it. He don't care where it's going. He just got. He's not gonna get hit. And I don't know what that is, whether it's a mental block. Uh, he's Like I said, he's a big, tough kid. I don't know. And and, and I, I may be proved wrong Saturday night, but I think that's part of it, why the line's dropping, because they don't trust Joe Milton. This season of the Vandy Sports Podcast has been made possible by my friend, Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. Just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville, but he sees regular folks like you and I as well. What people love about Jody's office is the ambiance. It's relaxing. It's friendly. Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. Whether your needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody today. Call him 615-270-2322. See him at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown or the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player and a huge Commodore booster, so go and talk Vandy sports with him while you're there. 
Go see Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of this podcast because without it, this season would not be possible. Well, look, that's been the key to what Vanderbilt's done lately. It's been getting after the passer. I had a lot of success at Kentucky with that. And Saturday, Richardson's not a guy that's easy to bring down, but they get to him and they've got him wrapped up. He makes an awful decision to throw the ball out in the flat. And and look, it was not a throw that should have been picked. Uh, Vanderbilt got some help on that one. The, the receiver, I mean, I, I don't know that he could do it if he was trying again. He's going to the ground. He knocks it up and behind oh. him, and Jalen Mahoney's standing right there to get the pick. I mean, there was there was a definite degree of luck involved in that, but where I was going to sure. go is I think that's how you have to play Joe Milton. I agree with you. I think, I think it's the reason why I said earlier, this will be a game that's very similar to Florida. If if we come out, play well, and they, are, you know, they're either going to be one of two things when that game starts. They're either going to be foaming at the mouth to, to prove that that embarrassment that just happened to them Saturday was a fluke, and they're going to come out wanting to, you know, blow us out, or they're going to be flat. One of the two things are going to happen for them. I don't think that's the case with us. We're not going to be flat. We may not play well, but we're not going to be flat. That's for certain. So. Uh, if you survive it early, and if it's a one-score game, I'll make this prediction. If it's a one-score game at the half, either way, I think Vanderbilt wins. If they're up 14 to 17 or 21 at half, it's over with. But I, I just I do feel like that's the situation because I've seen so many Vanderbilt Tennessee games, you can almost just feel it. I would love to be in the locker room two hours before the game and watching the kids getting dressed and getting ready because that's when you find out where they're at if they're quiet as a mouse when they walk in that locker room and they feel a little tight you're worried if they're coming in hooping and hollering got their headsets on and listening to their favorite music bouncing around it could be a good really good day for Vanderbilt fans yeah well I mean look there's no reason to think Vandy's going to play any other way than it's played the last two weeks I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. Uh, but the turnover thing, we've got to get that corrected. You know, the, the turnovers have been an issue. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't want to knock on any kids individually, but you know, Will's too good of a player for that to happen to him. That was not hard contact when he fumbled. He's got to be smarter than that. Put the ball away. You know, when you get in traffic, you got to put the ball away. And <clears throat> we can't do that. We, if we, again, if we lose the turnover battle, you're not going to win. And, that, and that's the formula for Vanderbilt historically. You can't. You know. The Kentucky game was an outlier. You know, if I were doing a summary of storylines of the year, there's there's a lot of them developing. I think one of them is just Clark Lee having his kids engaged, and in particularly, particular, ha, ah, especially, <laughs> especially because <laughs> of the way that South Carolina game went. How did you like that? I like. That. Anyway. I think that would be at the top of things. I think the offensive line playing well, down three starters and shifting guys around would be another. And I think another one would be C.J. Taylor. That kid is just getting better every week. He is a nightmare to contend with right now. Well, you know, every week, Chris, I ask you a question. I want to ask you this. I noticed at the end of the game he was – back at free safety he's a he's the last line of defense would you play him at free safety yeah i mean i, I think you almost have to against a team like tennessee because his instincts are great and when they've got those one-on-ones where they create that space and you have to you have to take them one-on-one cj's the guy i would vote for to be the one that's going to make that decision of who he's going to go get yeah, I think he and Mahoney at safety right now. Yes. Or or who you want. I think Dericky Wright, if you can use him as more of a linebacker, I think that fits him better. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um I'd send him after I'm, the passer as much as I can. Well, I'm I'm looking at the snap counts from Pro Football Focus last week. Um Bar's seen the field about half the time right now, exactly half the time last week. Yeah. Kane Patterson seen the field about 30% of the time. Of course, Orgy almost never comes off the field. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think shit. that right. I think those are your two safeties. I, I think it was you that said this. I think really a position switch is probably in order for Dericky. I don't know if you can play him at that that stand up rush in kind of position or, or where you put him. But I'm, I'm with you. I think that Taylor and Mahoney at safety are probably their best combination. And, and Jalen's had a good year too. Jalen's had a very solid career in his time at Vandy. Who would your starting two corners be Saturday? Well, let's see. The, the, the targeting rule, Anderson got ejected the first quarter. So he's back. So, yeah. so he does he play the whole game in that case? Yes, he's just—he was just out. He can play the whole game. Okay. Um, if you get targeted in the second half, you're out for the first half of the next game. Th- you know, they went—they went to Richard, and I'm looking at the Pro Football Focus grade. He played pretty well. I mean, I—I th- I think you start at this point. You start Richard and Lucian. Okay. Uh, you know, um, probably. Well, but R- Richard's been their nickel, though. I—I I think that's the issue. Is you probably have to start Richard inside. Which means I guess Anderson is back, um, starting on the outside, or, or Tyson Russell, perhaps. I don't know. They, they've got a they've got a hole at one or two of those corners. Well, I would rather those two play corner, and like you said, Hamoni and uh, uh, Wright and as safeties. That would be yeah. the last line of defense. Because look, listen, <clears throat> if Milton you mean Mahoney and back, Taylor, I'm sorry. I didn't mean right. I meant Taylor. If if Mahoney has a good day, to me, your strategy on defense, because they do a good job. When they spread you out, what happens is they've got so much space out there to run those routes, and those receivers have been drilled so well, and they got great hands. They're going to complete passes, and they're going to move the ball. Okay? You just That's just going to happen. But if you can keep them 20 to 20, let them get 80 yards every time in possession and hold them to field goals, that's how you're going to – that's how we can beat them. All right, let's do a let's do a thought exercise here. And I, I'm going to call. I haven't even thought about doing this ahead of the game or, or ahead of the podcast. Okay. Starting lineups next year could be a kind of an interesting exercise. Oh wow, be fun. Um, I would presume Capers starts on one edge, and the other. Goodness. I guess, yeah, well, they're sort of the same position. I don't know if you can bulk one of them up and make them both kind of rush ins. They're that um, that star position. Yeah. The the one I'm wondering about is, well, I, I, you, wait, you know what? You get Nate Clifton back for another year. Yes, you do. So, so he plays one end. Um. I mean, suddenly, suddenly you've got some depth at the star position, right? Because you've got Diacate and Agu have gotten some time. You get Capers back. I think Owusu's out of eligibility, unless that's a six-year situation where he takes the red shirt for COVID. Um, Christian James. Let me see if Christian James has got another year. I, I hate what did. COVID has done because it just makes it – He well, yeah, he can take a red shirt for 2020, so maybe you bring him back. He's a nice piece in the middle. Isha Wataha has been playing pretty much every week. He's going to get better. You wow, get man. Davion Davis back next year. I mean, this, this is presuming nobody hits the portal, right, which is a harder presumption than ever to make. So all of a sudden – you know, you get Bradley Mann who played some. He would be back. All of a sudden, now you have some depth on the defensive line. Maybe you hit someone in the portal that you bring back. That looks – it's it's not a great defensive line, but it's certainly better than it's been. Here's well, a question you, for you. Go ahead. I was just going to say what you're talking about, what I'm hearing is you're, is you're expounding depth. We will now have depth. And that's yeah. something that's always a challenge at Vanderbilt. So that's that's exciting in itself. Here's the one that I'm watching, and this is not based on any information at all. Okay, this is just 
wondering out loud of, of what the NFL thinks of him. Okay. I don't think Anthony Orgy is going to be like a, a top two or three round pick. Uh, in fact, he's, he's not going to be. I'm almost sure of that. You could get him back for a fifth year, potentially. Maybe he says, hey, I want to try to turn myself into a, a third round pick. You've seen crazier things happen there. Kane Patterson, I think, has got another year. And you would think he wants to play with his brother another year. Yeah, and his brother, let me tell you, his brother, I think, is going to be a really good player here. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. believe I've said this before, but if, if, I had, um, if I had to guess, if Langston Patterson didn't lead them in tackles in fall camp, it, it probably would have been close. I felt mm-hmm. like he was making a lot of plays when he was in there. And, of course, in fall camp, just about everybody is getting some reps. You got Ethan Barr's got another year. And then in the secondary, I, I guess, um, I don't know if Mahoney, let's see. I think Mahoney's got a COVID year. He does. He could take one for 2020 and come back. I think Jalen could make an NFL roster. Uh, I don't know if he's oh. going to get drafted, but he could get into camp and it wouldn't shock me if he made a team. I don't know if he wants to come back and maybe try to get drafted. We Taylor well, certainly is, is going to be a kid that you, you, you probably worry teams are going to come after him in the portal. But if you get him back, he's very serviceable. You get you should get Jadis Richard back. Um, Lucian, I think well, Anderson's got another year for sure. Um, I'm not was, sure about Lucian. Uh, Lucian's a fifth year senior. Okay, so he's. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he didn't play 2020. So right. I, I would and think B- he's done. Right, right would have eligibility. I mean, look, you've you've got almost this whole defense coming back. Well, and then there's some freshmen that haven't played for whatever reason. I don't Trudell Berry, I don't know what the story is with him. Uh, uh the the Wharton kid, I don't know where he is right now and and then Taco yeah. Wright. You know, it's, there's, just, there's some depth there and uh, some things that can happen in development through now and uh, next season that can really give you some quality depth where you can rotate those guys in. Yeah, they, they will have a lot of options at corner next year. Guys will be factors yep. that didn't play this year. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And, uh, and then offensively, look at that side of the ball. I yeah, mean, and an, another think- one we missed was Devin Lee on defense too, by the way. And Devin played great. He's run a great job. So yeah, you you've get man, you how many offensive linemen do you have with experience back next year? It's a lot. It's the let's see. Uh, in my mind, uh, let's see. First Ketchik, of all, I, Hansen are back. Um I don't know about Uzebo and Hernandez. Uh Castillo's back. Castillo's back. He's a, he's a sophomore. Uh Bramer is a fifth year senior. Hernandez has got a year. Um, Pittsburgh's back. Pittsburgh's back. Hanson's back. I'll tell you a kid to watch for next year. And he Grayson reminds Morgan. me. Yes, he reminds me of Wesley Johnson. He yeah. reminds me of Wesley Johnson at his age. Um, I, look, I look for him to play a lot next year. Uh, the Seagull kid didn't play much, has he? No, he Blake hasn't played Nelson. at all. Yeah, Leighton Nelson, Gunnar Hansen is back. I mean, yeah, even the kid that got a little playing time, was it Trent Weaver that got some playing time? Yes. I mean, Bradley Ashmore's back, uh, assuming he's healthy. You know, it's just, again, you're looking at depth, 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 and that's something that's it's hard to develop, and they've done a great job of that. Have we taken our licks because of it? Yeah, we've had some 55 to nothings and, Last year, of two or three really embarrassing games, but it's helped. I mean, it's 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 developed these kids. Yeah, receivers are all back. You probably lose a tight end or two. Ray Davis has got another year. You've got all your quarterbacks eligible to come back. It's just it, it's really wild to look at this, and I, I think it'll be very interesting to see how they do the off season. Probably this is a conversation we need to have next week. But, um, yeah, 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 we could do a whole show with that. I'd love that. Yeah. 
Right. Well, may, maybe we'll expand on that a little bit next week. But it just occurs to me as we're looking at this is you've got, and maybe that'll be our homework assignment in, in, in the off week. Um, if if they lose that game, that's probably a good exercise. If they beat Tennessee, then we're probably having a completely different podcast. But yeah, maybe maybe trying to put in some time and project of what what this looks like next year would be an interesting well, exercise. Hope, hopefully we'll be doing that. Hopefully we'll be doing that in two weeks and we'll just be able to talk about a victory. Hopefully that'd be great. By the way, they are talk not going to be going to a bowl uh, on APR. I did the research on that this weekend. They are. Did you realize they were 57 tied for 57th in APR? And, like and how does that, that tells you how big of a disaster that last Mason year yeah. was. That that should prove to you know when you were getting blasted on uh, and I'm going to defend you a bit a bit here when you were getting blasted by some folks about uh, things aren't that bad over there Chris is just a negative person and blah blah what blah 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 if that doesn't show it to you that's the lowest I ever remember in Vanderbilt history now I may be wrong that in my mind that's the lowest it's ever been in Vanderbilt history so. For those people that doubted that, that are, if that doesn't show them, nothing will. Oh, you should have seen some of the texts and emails I got from people that year while that was going on, including from some people in the media. Um, yeah, that's shame on them. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, and, and, and among and among other things, this is this is where it, I mean, it was people saying. You know, you're making too much of the Sarah Fuller deal. You should just keep your mouth shut about that and, and go along with the flow. And, and I said, hey, look, that, that that's all fine and good if you want to think that. But if you don't think that's having an effect on morale and on, and I brought this up at the time, you could probably go find it back in writing where I said, you got graduation and APR rates to worry about. Um, because those get hit too. It's not just a thing that it's come and gone and it doesn't leave a mark. And look, if they are if they are having a normal Vanderbilt year, um, that they may get in a bowl at five and seven. And I'm not a big proponent of, of five and seven teams going to bowls, I'm sure. I'm but in this sure. case, a it would mean something, and b it would get them a lot of practice for again a group that is yeah. that is coming back. Y- yeah. You can you can think whatever you want about that, but it is it is crystal clear now that has left a mark. Well, in, in circumstances, also to me, whether you go five and seven, it's how you go five and seven. If we were to lose to Tennessee in overtime Saturday, yeah, those kids probably deserve a better fate, you know. But if if you go out there and you get beat bad, by, you shouldn't go to a bowl after you've just got blasted or something. I don't I don't like that. You know, I've well, seen teams yeah decline a bowl too when they played horribly in their last game. Yeah, I I got um, some of the line of reasoning and and what I got was, um, well, well, this team hasn't won a game, and so the players don't have a right to really have an opinion on anything. I I literally got those those messages from people in the media and and also Vanderbilt fans. (laughs) If they could have just been a fly on the wall at that place during those times, from everything I've heard, and everything that I know to be facts, they would have never addressed you the way they did because they just didn't know. And you don't. Oh, know I, I don't. I don't think it would have been. I don't know that it would have been any different. To be honest with you. Oh wow. Well then, that's a shame. That's just yeah. being blind. That's just being blind. I'm sorry. I got nothing for that type of stuff. Uh, what else do we have in terms of stuff to discuss before we hit the mailbag? Well, as as far as just the game itself uh, against Florida, one one more thing I'd like to say was offensively, I loved what we did with the tight ends. We got it seemed like everybody was involved, and and of course Ray did his thing like he's been doing. Uh, but I thought Patrick Smith had his best game. He did. They needed that too. Okay, we've got a ton of questions in the mailbag. Uh, we've got 14, I think, to be exact, although some of these may be comments on questions. So I don't think I'm going to go through every one of them. But with that, 
Our mailbag is sponsored by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call at 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Okay, let's start here. On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do the recent wins affect the following? This is from Matt, the Matt 23 who always has really good questions. Um, all right, number one, on a scale from 1 to 10, how much do the recent wins affect the following? First one is player retention from this year's roster. I think that's a 9 or a 10 because if, if they now have evidence that it can be done and you can turn it around and you can win there. So if they were thinking, you know, I don't want to keep losing games, then they would be gone. So or I have a better chance of being leaving. I think it's a 9 or a 10. Yeah, I think you're probably right, and we just don't know, but I think your evidence is look how these kids have played. I mean, everything was going against them, and they, they pulled two out of the fire that that nobody thought were possible. And again, Saturday, you've got – I don't know what the crowd was. To me, I'm sitting in the bridge. I think it – I thought it was 70%, 60 or 70% Florida fans. So, again, these kids do it without having a – a huge home or a home field advantage much. By the way, what do you think the crowd looks like Saturday? I do think there'll be some Tennessee fans won't come for two reasons. They're they're just if they feel like if you, this is historically, if they feel like there's the chance that Vanderbilt can beat them, a lot of them don't come. When they know that they're going to beat Vanderbilt, or they feel like there's not much of a chance. They'll show up in droves and try to do all their stupid checkerboard and all that crap. I think it'll be kind of like it was Florida, a little bit more Tennessee maybe. I think there's probably 12,000 Vanderbilt and 28,000 Tennessee. Okay, the the next topic, how does that affect the 23 high school and portal class? The high school class, again, this is basically the same thing. I think it's a 9 or a 10 because now they've got evidence, tangible evidence that you can win at Vanderbilt. The portal thing is totally different for us at Vanderbilt. I think portal kids, you just you, you target a kid, you go after him with everything you got. So I don't know that winning and losing, just like Jeremy Lucian, getting him, he's he's been very serviceable for us and he's done a pretty good job. You know, kids like that will come to Vanderbilt, period, because they, you know, you can come in and get a Vanderbilt degree. Okay, the uh, 24 high school class, I would presume your answer would be the same there. Same thing. Last one, fan support for next year. Uh, it, you know, every time you get a win and get a skin on the wall, it, it, you, you may develop some, but it's going to take a long time to win. Uh, and unfortunately, our fan base, and I tell people this all the time, to me, our football fan base, on our best day, we can get fifteen to 18,000 in there that are Vanderbilt fans, okay? In Memorial Gym, our best day, we can get 10,000. And that's where we're at. It used to not be that way. I had some – my wife and I had some guests over at the house last night that are old Vanderbilt fans, been around forever. And uh, they still go. But of their friends, they said 80 to 90% of them are gone. And uh, gone is in gone reason. from the earth, or just gone from the no, fan base. Gone, no, gone from, gone from coming to the games. They're still Vanderbilt fans, but they just got so beat down by the the losing in the last four or five years, and then all the other options that you have socially, um, the Predators, the Titans. You know, the, their dollars. You know, we we can't do this, and then. One of the big frustrations, and I hate to be negative on a day like after coming up to Florida, but one of the big problems they have is where they've given money for whatever it be, parking spots in McGugan for game days where they uh, Vanderbilt starts charging them these crazy numbers, and then the spots aren't even used for tailgate, stuff getting their tickets wrong. You know, I've even heard horror stories where someone has a ticket and you come in and your seat's gone. So. Stuff like that, just not handling the fan base and, and having that amount of care that you should have. You know, if someone's willing to give you money and become a fan and call you, they can't even get a call back sometimes. Now, I hope that's being corrected. I hope that's part of ancillary stuff you don't have to worry about anymore. But that stuff, people get tired of that. 
Okay, uh, other assignment for next week is how do you handle ticketing and marketing and building the fan base back? That that could be a podcast in itself. Right. And and I'm not making an excuse for Vander, but I think they're I think it's a hard thing. But but to me, that's where your athletic director and everybody over there that's getting paid the big bucks, that's where you got to put roll up your sleeves and go to work. Okay, VU and Georgia, what have you seen as the biggest keys in the last two SEC victories? To be honest with you, and people are going to think this is silly, there hasn't been a big change. There's not been, it's not been a magic potion to me. Uh, you have to, first of all, if you want to just talk about individuals, you have to give Mike Wright a ton of credit for managing the football games. He's done terrific. I think you have to give the coaches a ton of credit for the plays they're calling, the sets they're calling on defense. But They've been doing. They've had the opportunity to do these type of things in other games against Missouri and Carolina, but they didn't execute because they didn't have the confidence. So a little thing called confidence is the main reason. Okay, door fan six. When's the last time you saw a Vandy team play this hard? Seems like they're playing with a lot of heart and never giving up every time they're on the field. Well, I, I would go back to Mason's second or third team maybe those those guys played with this type of energy and confidence um but it's been a while so i guess that was 2016 maybe um yeah that feels about right or or maybe maybe the 18 tennessee game yeah well as for a for a single game yeah, oh for it yeah 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 talking about over a season and where you i think 16 was a they played well just about every game. Yeah, and, and 16, let's see. That ended just like this one, hopefully win. That, we beat Ole Miss. We were 4-6, and six, I think I'm correct. And then we beat Tennessee was going to go to the Sugar Bowl with Josh Dobbs. That was the yeah. game where Alvin Kamara stepped out of bounds on fourth yeah. down. Instead of going for the first down, he didn't know. He thought it was third down, and he just took it out of bounds. Yeah. So we beat Ole Miss and Tennessee the last two home games. Okay, go doors 94. Looks like Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer was in the locker room and may have received a game ball. Does he recall previous chancellors being with the team after a win like that? Absolutely not. I saw Joe White in the locker room one time. Uh, now, David was on the sidelines, David Williams, when, as the vice chancellor. Uh, Gordon Gee, I think, came in the locker room once after a big win. I can't remember what game it was. I did see Gordon Gee in there once. Um, uh, if, uh, but that's it. Yeah, and I know he was in there because I was down in the tunnel and I watched him walk in there. Um, in fact, I took yeah, a little, I, little video I, I of that. It's on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Okay. Um, Raiders 1967, Luke, there were nine Vanderbilt players and three Gators in the pile digging for the football in the end zone after the muff punt. Vanderbilt worked harder and fought harder than the Gators for that ball. What does that say about the team under Coach Clark Lee? What does it mean for players like Wesley Schelling, Tommy Eccles, and Jack Barton, who were in there fighting for the ball, who never get recognized to have that reward of a special team's touchdown and a win? Well, it's funny. If you, if you go back and look at it, it looks like Tommy Eccles. Uh, is the one who recovered it or had his hands on it. and then It, it was, was Gamarian Carter had his hands on it. And then, okay. as, as I saw it, the, the TV guys were talking about they didn't, you know, Schelling took the ball away from it. No, I, I think what happened, th there was an angle from the backside. It looked to me like that ball, Carter had it at first, and it looked like it slipped through his legs. I, I When I watched it, and maybe if I watched it again, I would change my mind. Uh, but but the narrative that Schelling wrestled that away from a teammate, I don't think that's true. I think that was a ball that was slipping away, and he was just the guy there to make the play. Well, you know, a lot of times in those piles, the ball will exchange hands two and three times anyway until the sure. referee's out. So, but but what that means is so funny. I watched uh, Wesley afterwards. I watched the ball into the sideline with my eyes and. Why, you know, usually he goes down there and, and uh, starts snapping or whatever he does. This, he was just going back and forth like a chicken with his head cut off with a big smile on his face. So yeah, that's something he'll remember the rest of his life and tell his grandkids, that type of thing. 
Yeah, and he's a he's a scholarship player. Um, now, yeah, yeah, yeah I, th- I think he was. I think they gave him a scholarship out of high school, actually. But um, did they? I think. Correct. Anyway, he's, yeah, I thought he's he earned one. Well, you you don't usually see that, right? Uh, that's that's kind of no. rare. No, you don't. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Um, let's see. We got a, we got a lot of comments on the questions, so I'm trying to get to the next question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think we're out of questions. So, in that case, what have you got to kind of wrap this thing up today? Well, I, I'll uh, I'll. Uh, Again, I want to reach out to the Vanderbilt fan base. Guys, If you ha- please don't sell your tickets, first of all, to UT fans. If you're a real, true Vanderbilt fan, you won't do that, period. Secondly, we had whatever, I guess, ten to 12,000 fans against Florida. Have at least that many, more if we can get our hands on tickets, whatever it may be. I don't think there's any left on the, on the black market. I don't know how that – if Tennessee's gobbled them up, maybe some Tennessee fans will now sell them to some Vanderbilt fans if you've got – friends that are Tennessee fans, but do your best to support these kids. And please, because it's senior day, get there early. Those kids deserve that. They've been through a lot, probably more than just about any team in Division One football. Uh, get there early and support those kids, uh, um, and hopefully we'll have a, another happy Saturday. Trying to find ticket prices. ESPN has got to deal with a ticket – broker where it's got them linked says tickets as low as $66. I think yesterday those were in the seventies or eighties. Uh, and I'm guessing a couple of weeks ago have been higher than that. So it looks to me like ticket prices are falling, which tells me Tennessee fans are probably selling. Well, how many tickets are available on those sites? I don't, I don't know anything about how to navigate them. How, 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 how many seats are still available out there? Let's see. Uh, this is on Vivid Seats, by the way. Um, you've got a single ticket, sixty-seven dollars. A single ticket, seventy-one. Yeah, you know these are all singles. Oh, okay. So I mean, you've got uh, tickets left, two thousand. I don't know. Yeah, here's one. One to three tickets for seventy-four dollars each. Um. When you get up into the pair at 70s and 80s, it looks like there's a decent amount of seats. Now, some people are asking over $100. Um, here's one to five tickets. And these, a lot of these are on the visiting side, which is where the other team's That's fans the- usually sit. Yeah, I'm seeing them in yeah. U and R. I'm seeing a lot in Section R. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's closer yeah. to the visiting section than than uh, the student section, but it's kind of in that in between. Yeah, there's a lot of tickets out there for sale. That's good. Um, I think- now a lot of these you're going to have to pay a hundred dollars or more, but I do wonder if the tickets are going to fall as we get closer to game time. Um, the most anybody is asking. Is two hundred fourteen dollars for a ticket? That's one to four tickets, and those are in the end zone. I was down in that where they where you can plug in your phone and all that down by the scoreboard. No, 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 no. The, it's in the closed end zone, and it's on oh, the really? side diagonal from the visitor section. So that's probably oh, okay. Vandy fans. But um, yeah, probably. Anyway, it's it's interesting. There's um. That you're seeing single tickets in the in, in the '60s now. I'll, I'll be interested to follow the market, but I did I did look at that yesterday, and the uh, the prices for the cheaper seats have fallen a little bit. So, I think that's maybe a good sign for. I, I think the uh, checkerboard in the stadium has been squelched a little bit. Yeah, we'll see. Um, hey, Luke, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week. Yes, absolutely. All right, thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS, Michael Kendrick of the Kendrick Group, 
We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrislee70 at gmail.com. We also ask that you subscribe to our website, VandySports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at VandySports.com. Follow me at ChrisLee70. And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.